The Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by BetaShares, serving over 1 million investors across Australia's broadest range of ETFs. After years of record low interest rates, income-seeking investors have been returning to cash and fixed income ETFs, drawn by the attractive returns on offer. Equity income funds have also been generating healthy income streams. BetaShares provides yield-hungry investors with a range of income-focused funds to choose from, including ETFs offering exposure to cash, bonds, hybrids, Australian shares, and international shares. To explore the BetaShares ETF range, visit betashares.com.au and consider if the fund is right for you. I'm also proud to say that this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, including buy, hold, and sell share recommendations, click the link in your podcast player to secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. This Australian Investors Podcast episode is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, use the coupon code RASK and secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. We're proud to have the Intelligent Investor as an ongoing supporter of the Australian Investors podcast. As a result, RASK does not earn a volume-based fee. Simply head to intelligentinvestor.com.au or use the link in your podcast player to access your free trial. This episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is also proudly supported by SelfWealth, Australia's leading independent broker. Over 120,000 investors trust SelfWealth with over $9 billion in equities. With SelfWealth, you can trade ASX, US, and Hong Kong listed shares for a flat fee. On a $10,000 investment with Comsec, you'd pay $29.95 in fees. Yet with SelfWealth, it's just $9.50. The thing I like about SelfWealth is the full access to fundamental company data and how easy it is to trade US, Hong Kong, and Aussie shares in one place. You can see your Apple shares and ACDC ETF right beside each other. To join SelfWealth now, use the link in your podcast player or head to selfwealth.com.au and use the coupon code RASK during sign-up. Thanks for tuning in to today's podcast. Please remember that all of the information in this podcast episode is limited to general information only. That means the information is not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So you should seek the advice of a licensed and trusted financial professional before acting on the information. And before you acquire or apply for a financial product, please read the PDS or product disclosure statement, which should be available on the issuer's website. Lastly, please keep in mind that past performance is not indicative of future performance. In this episode, I'm joined by Scott Phillips. You may know Scott as the Chief Investment Officer for The Motley Fool Australia. This podcast was recorded in both audio and video form, so you can watch it on the Rask YouTube page. Scott is one of Australia's leading voices on investing, but also personal finances and shareholder advocacy. Closer to home, Scott has been instrumental in my development. During my time with The Motley Fool Australia, I was privileged to be mentored by Scott and see him develop his own craft up close. It might seem odd for me and Scott to do a podcast together, given he runs the Motley Fool Money podcast, which sits in iTunes alongside some of Rask's shows, and because the Motley Fool is a competitor. However, I think Scott's generosity and willingness to come on the program shows his true character, an honest, humble, straight shooter. In this episode, we talk about Scott's journey to becoming an investor. His passion started early, he would request annual reports in the mail and crunch his own ratios. We talk about Scott's true passions, his lessons learned, and so much more. I hope you enjoy this episode with Scott Phillips, Chief Investment Officer of The Motley Fool Australia. Scott, thanks for taking some time to join me on the podcast, mate. It's an absolute pleasure. Oh, and thank you for having me, mate. It's good to get the, the band back together. Some yeah. may not you know you were a former Motley Fool employee, so it's kind of kind of fun to be back in the same virtual room again, mate. Thank you. It is, yeah. We're recording virtually from from your place just outside Sydney, and yes. I'm in Melbourne. Fortunately, I think it's a bit of a role reversal at the time of recording. We can be in the office, you can't. Um, hopefully, <laughs> exactly. hopefully, um, you know things clear up and everything's for the better soon. Mm. Mm. Um, you know, in the lead up to this, mate, I, I was asking some of the guys in the team, I was saying, you know, what questions should I ask Scott? And <laughs> a lot of them know of you, right? Like so many people know of you. 
uh, in Australia. And we'll get to that in a minute. But <laughs> what a lot of people don't know is kind of where you came from. Like, yeah, nice. Ha- okay. and, and the role that you've played with The Motley Fool since it's arrived mm-hmm. in Australia has been pretty extraordinary. So maybe we'll just go back to the beginning. The, the question I like to ask is kind of, was there any early mentor or people around you or influences in your life that led you on a journey to investing from a young age or did it come on later? Yeah, so I love this question, mate, because it gives me a chance to call out two people, two high school teachers. Uh, my high school maths teacher, Mr. Moyer, and economics teacher, Mr. Barnett, who uh, were both instrumental in their own ways. I was first introduced to the concept of compound interest. I want to say year eight or year nine maths, I wish I could remember, by Mr. Moyer, who put an example on the board. It was one of those, if you save $1,000 a year between 18 and 30, you'll have X dollars at retirement type things. Mm. And it was kind of that, that exponential idea. That was the first time that the light bulb went on that I can remember thinking, there's something here. There's, it's, it's a thing, right? I wish I'd done what he said, by the way, that, which is a regret I can talk about later if you want. But uh, the, the other one was Mr. Barnett, who we would sit down in economics. And this is, this will date me. I don't know how many of your listeners are, are what age. You can tell me later. But uh, there was a time when the only place you found share prices was in the newspaper. Remember those? They were a thing. Mm-hmm. And so we would get the Sydney Morning Herald and the, uh, the AFR delivered to school with student rates. And we'd sit down in economics and open the middle pages to the share tables. And you look through the, you know, by, by alphabetical order or market cap, you look at the company names and the share prices and that kind of stuff. And that kind of, just, again, opened my eyes to what was this thing called the share market. And then I can't, kind of can't really draw a straight line between that and something else, but I kind of knew it was a thing. I always knew I liked business and we can get onto that in a minute if you want, but that, that was kind of the early, the early interest. Thereafter, I kind of got self-taught. Ended up, by the way, finding the Motley Fool, which is his own story. But um, yeah, that, that was that was the early days. So, Mr. Moore and Mr. Barnett, if you're listening, I owe a debt of gratitude. Thank you. So, so that was year, you we say year seven, year eight, year nine, somewhere around there. Yeah. Um, so, you was anyone in your personal life investing? No. So, this is the funny thing, right? My old man used to think or say the stock market was a casino. And having done this for a while, I can absolutely see why he would think that. If you think about the reporting, the, the conversations, the, the you know the, the stuff that bubbles up to the top of public consciousness is the this company goes broke, that company makes a fortune, this CEO gets fined mm. or sent to jail, um, share price go up and down for no apparent reason. So I get it, right? And so yeah, I, I, almost the reverse. I was actually I don't have anyone in my personal life who was saying yeah, go and invest outside those school influences and a bit of reading. Um, and it was said absolutely the reverse was, you know, dad would say, isn't the stock market just a casino? You see what's going on in the nightly news. How can you possibly do it? Um, which I think probably for me actually was positive because it meant I kind of had to, from first principles, actually go through what I believed rather than, you know, it's, it's a bit like, oh, let's not get a religion, but, you know, sometimes people adopt their family's religion because you're brought up in it. And I wasn't brought up in investing. I, I just literally had to kind of understand for myself, hang on, what is this thing? Is it a casino? Is dad right? Is my high school economics teacher right? Or more importantly, maybe where are they right? Where are they wrong? And so that helped me kind of define and, and develop my own sense of what investing really was, what the stock market really was, what was good, what was bad, what I need to be careful of and, and look out for. What what resources were you using? Was it just the paper to find those answers? Yeah, back so <laughs> very early on. And, and this is kind of how I stumbled on The Motley Fool back in the day. Um, I don't know if you heard this story before. I imagine you have because I told it a few times. But uh, I so I was reading the, the the finance page of the City Morning Herald, sitting at my desk at work, and it's one of those weird things that there's no reason to believe that I, that I would should have remembered this particular memory, but it just stuck in my mind. I was flicking through the page, and they were talking about some of these investment strategies. And as it turns out, a strategy that Motley Fool no longer actually follows, but they mentioned this weird company called the Motley Fool. And just said, again, usual thing, weird name. You know, what's this thing about? And I jumped online and found fool.com it was only in the us back then and that's literally how i found the motley fool was from an article on the smh but yeah everything was everything was on paper in fact when i first started investing and again this will date me horribly i actually had to call the investor relations department so you'd call up woolies you'd ask their investor relations department you'd say could you please send me the last three or four annual reports and that's the only way you get them you literally had to call them and get the reports there were no pdfs nothing was online and they'd send them in the mail and you get this chunky big envelope full of annual reports. And if you've ever done BHPs, by the way, they, they're even bigger now, but they were always 200, 300 pages each. So you get this massive thing in the mail. And then I literally would type in, and again, this is part of my, my background, uh, I typed in, you know, 
years worth of p ls balance sheets there weren't even cash flow statements back then that's how old i am uh and so you, I, I typed these things into excel to calculate the ratios and the growth rates and it was entirely entirely manual there are a couple of books around you know the usual books some of them are still around by the way but um no it was it was it was learning largely through the newspaper uh through uh the conversation the afr and the and, and the smh and then eventually when things started to go online the multi full so that's fascinating so did you you studied commerce yeah um did you know that you wanted to start use that commerce degree to get into investing or was it kind of this is a general field it seems like a pretty good degree for me yeah, you've nailed it on the ladder mate i had no idea i was going to go into investing in fact even when i joined the motley fool i wasn't going to go into investing and again we can talk about that in a minute if you want but um no i i, I did commerce so i was always good at commerce and economics at school I, you know, there's things that people just get. And I've got a mate who gets things like astronomy and science. And I love chatting to him because he, he gets those things the way I get investing and, and, and business and commerce, right? So he gets that stuff. I'm like, man, I, I, don't, I don't know that stuff. I didn't know that stuff was out there. You know, how do you kind of, and people, if you find your own path. So my path was business. I got it. I understood it. I vividly remember in year seven commerce, arguing with a, a, a commerce teacher about the lines, maybe the old, the old uh, price and volume, elasticity mm-hmm. curves, right? So when the price goes up, the, you, you consume more. When the price goes up, businesses want to produce more because they get more price for it. And I vividly remember saying to the guy, this isn't right because businesses will produce what they make the most profit out of, not just what the price is highest of. Like, it just made no sense to me, right? Because I mm-hmm. kind of already got that instinctive sense of this more than just the basic concepts. Now, of course, the commerce teacher says, "Yeah, okay, fine, Scott, but you need to want, you know, walk before you can run here, mate." Uh, but the, that was the reality. I just, I just got it. But I didn't know what I wanted to do. In fact, when I left uni, I, I got a full time job as an assistant manager of a Max Liquor store, the forerunner of BWS in, in New South Wales. Um, and I was doing that for the for the last six months of my uni degree. I then went to Woolworths head office because I got a relationship with those people and kind of just got a, a job there. I was kind of just, I don't follow my nose, just follow my feet, right? Just for whatever came next I was going into. Um, but it was something that I just got. I knew, I understood, I could reasonably um, intuit. And so business was always going to be a career of some degree or another. It turned out some of the jobs I did thereafter actually made me ready for investing. So I was really, really fortunate. But no, a series of happy accidents is the best way I can describe it. Mm. It's because uh, the, some of the first jobs out of uni, I think maybe the first job or the first career that you embark upon is probably mm. the one that... I find, and I've spoken about this on the show before, is influences people the most, right? Yes. Like I was extremely fortunate to find The Motley Fool at a very special time in my development. Um, How about for you then? Yeah. What what, what were those jobs? Like, um, Can you just kind of explain that stretch of of your career? Because I I think you were pretty successful in, in what you were doing. So I guess yeah. Look, it's it's hard not to, in hindsight, talk about the investing angle as well. But I'll try and I'll try and do a bit of both as we as we chat about it. So essentially, I always had an affinity for numbers, mm-hmm. and I found myself. And look, you know, so I, I worked at a grog shop, uh, you know, as a casual mm-hmm. going through uni, and I obviously did an okay job of that. So when the assistant manager's job came up, they said, "Hey, do you want it?" I was like, "Of course I do." You know, I'm getting I get paid a full time wage. I was paid twenty seven thousand eight hundred dollars. Yeah, I'm happy to say that. I, man, I was the richest bloke. I lived at home at a cheap car. I couldn't spend all that money. That's funny how, how life catches up with you. So that, look, you know, and that did that. And then I the head office job was in the liquor department at head office. Um, and again, they knew I was capable. I talked to head office on multiple times, and things like I just picked up problems or I'd ask them for questions. And and obviously through doing that. I kind of came to their attention, someone who knew a bit about what was going on rather than just following the, the usual rules and, and, and mm. going through the motions. So they kind of knew me. But my first job out of, out of Woolies was actually at Heinz, the, the food and beverage business, or oh, food business basically. And that was as a business analyst. And so my job there was really to help the sales and marketing teams understand what was going on. Everything from market share data, sales data, profitability data, promotions. You know, we see Heinz tomato sauce on special, uh, understanding what was going on there, helping them analyze the 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 realities of the business, prepare prepare, uh, prepare presentations for sales meetings. And so you kind of, you're right at the very crux of business decision making. And that's the first step. And I, again, to your point, I'm super lucky because I then spent the next, I guess, eight years, nine years of my career in jobs that effectively were helping sales and marketing teams make business decisions. And if you think about what investing is, it's doing that from the outside in. Once you understand the business model of a company you work for, and I work for a whole lot of multinational food and beverage businesses, uh, Heinz, Diageo, the alcohol company, uh, Valcorp, who were distributed locally for Lavazza and Dilmar, uh, Legina, Can Tomatoes, Serena Tuna. I work for 20th Century Fox. 
And so all of these businesses, as you went Blackmores, as you go through them, you're kind of you're learning about business, right? What makes a difference? How you know the things that that push and pull a, an organization to be successful. And you think about that again from the outside. You know, I couldn't have had a better a better experience. It's a, a hackneyed phrase that Buffett used, and people repeat it often. But it is true in my sense that you know Buffett says he's a better businessman because he's an investor, and a better investor because he's a businessman. And that was absolutely my experience as I went through. I was learning all these skills that it turns out make you a really good business analyst. And and you know, investing is for some people reading charts and numbers on screens and stuff. And I couldn't, I couldn't hate that more. What I love is, is analyzing the businesses themselves and looking at them and saying, why would this business be successful or not? Is it likely to grow further or not? Where's the market going for this business? Who are its competitors and customers? I kind of, as I said, that's exactly what you do inside a business and having worked for quite a number of them. I saw some good, some bad, some ugly, some great, by the way. Um, and that really put me in good set. I think when it came time to end up joining the Motley Fool through a, a bit of a convoluted process, um, it just worked out nicely that it was exactly the right thing, the right preparation for me. It wasn't the usual, you know, go to uni, do a do a finance degree, work for an investment bank, but it was actually the better path, I think, which was learn all about business and then come and apply those skills. Did you uh, did you buy shares in any of the companies that you worked for? So yes, uh, and and there's a lesson of well, half a dozen lessons there too. Um, <laughs> I, I got shares in Heinz through the employee share plan, uh, and and that was lovely. Uh, I bought shares in Blackmores and then sold them way too cheaply back when the shares then subsequently went to two hundred bucks. That hurt for a little while. Um, so yeah, I did I did a couple of couple of those businesses a couple of times. It's uh I never bought them in Twentieth Century Fox. Didn't buy them in in Diageo actually at the time, partly because they were listed overseas and that was just too hard for me at the at that time. I didn't have an overseas brokerage account. Subsequently rectified that one. Uh, but yeah, no, it was one of those things. Ironically, you know, selling Blackmores too early was one of those cases where actually I was too close to the business, and that's also a problem. Is when you're so bound up in the company, um, you can't necessarily see the bigger picture, or you overemphasize things that actually matter less. And so having that one step removed bit of perspective, I think, actually really helped. And I, I don't know for sure, but I wonder whether had I left that business earlier. Uh, or never worked for it, whether I still would have held those shares as they went up to two hundred dollars and something and change. Uh, I think I possibly would. I won't. I won't give myself too much credit. Maybe I wouldn't have. Uh, but being a bit removed also is useful. Yeah, I find that, and you probably hear this all the time, right? You speak to people that um, are in, you know, full time occupations or just PAYG, and they work for a business, and they think, "Oh no, I'd never invest in them." But they don't have <laughs> the. They don't see the full picture. They don't see the forest from right. the trees. They only see their function, right? Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Right. And so. I guess, did you, were there, are there any other threads that were common amongst these businesses? Because if I look at like at Goodman Field, I look at Blackmores, or yeah. all of them really, um, Heinz, strong yeah. brands, right? Or sell mm-hmm. products that have strong brands. So I'm seeing yeah. a connection to to, to companies that, um, that have these strong brands that may have manifested later in life, i.e. now with you investing in companies that also have strong consumer brands. Yeah, that's a, that's a great insight. You've you've absolutely nailed it because I, I think brands are, despite that we all kind of know brands are important, they're seriously seriously undervalued by many people. Um, Elon Musk famously said that moats are dead or dumb or whatever he said, um, which I couldn't disagree more about. Um, but uh, you know, the idea of a brand when you can charge double the price of a home brand bottle of tomato sauce and sell Heinz, for example, um, when you're Blackmores and you consistently sell your vitamins for 25% more than the competition, um, again, go through any of those companies. We're talking about Lavazza, um, who, who managed to to sell a you know coffee for a, a nice premium over over most other coffees. Brands matter because mm-hmm. brands are about pricing power. They're about loyalty. They're about ROI on marketing. Um, brand awareness is so incredibly difficult to achieve once you've got it and if you can maintain it. And by the way, plenty of good brands have died. So let's not let's not pretend brand is the only solution or the only uh, the only thing you need to worry about. Kodak had a wonderful brand for a while, um, you know. But but if you've got a branded business, it really does make you simply more likely to succeed and gives you far far more defensive. Uh, opportunities, frankly, the number of times you can fail if you're a big brand compared to an upstart who really gets one shot at it. Plenty of upstarts, again, still succeed, right? Again, and Kodak can fail. But brand is is super, super valuable because it talks to, you know, we talk about recurring revenue with software, right? And this is a bit tongue in cheek, but not too much. You know, some of the biggest, best recurring revenue businesses in Australia, they are Woolies and Coles. Mm. Now, I'm not saying they are going to grow at the rate of software companies. I'm not saying they have the same margins as software companies. What I'm saying is they've created a business and, and an offensive business that actually has almost all of us shopping in one or both of those most weeks, again, outside lockdown. And so you think about the value of, of brand, it is just so incredibly important, so incredibly valuable. 
Um, and again, think of some of the fad businesses that didn't have that were popular for a while, but never really struck gold when it comes to branding. Um, I think it's a massive, massive benefit, massive opportunity. And by the way, they're also easier to understand businesses. And don't ever believe that degree of difficulty in investing correlates with investing returns, right? Buffett's mm-hmm. some of his successes are buying Amex and Coke. Right. These are not complex tech businesses. You don't have to know the ins and outs of everything. Now, you can make money doing that, by the way. I'm not saying you shouldn't try and do well if you know lots about tech or you know lots about biotechnology or something else. By all means, if you've got a competitive advantage in that space, go for it. If you can find a simple business, you don't get extra points for degree of difficulty. You know, you should invest in the simplest business you can find if it's offering attractive returns because you know more about it. Less can go wrong. Um, there's simply fewer moving parts. So I think if you're an investor looking to get started, Don't fall into the trap of it has to be complex, it has to be difficult, it has to involve algebra and multiple spreadsheets. Sometimes the simple things in life, as they say, are literally often the best. I've got a question for you um, around the 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 benefits of brand, and one of those is that traditionally brands, and this this particularly relates to consumer goods, which is Mm -hmm. um, typically brands lower search cost, right? Like the the intangible effort uh, to pick. A tomato sauce you, you're familiar with i i have heinz at home um and and baked beans and all that sort of stuff you know mm-hmm, them, right mm-hmm. yep. um m- maybe just reflecting i don't know the context of elon musk's uh comment but <laughs> do you think that um the internet and the way we consume products and we find products these days has fundamentally changed and yep. impacted those brands like amazon and google etc so I do. I think it's much harder to build a new brand, frankly, these days, because think about the discovery process when you're in Woolies. So it's harder to get a brand on shelf at Woolies, right? Because there's only a limited amount of space. But once mm-hmm. you've got that product on shelf, you're in the decision set by definition. And we talked about Amazon having effectively limitless aisles, and it's absolutely true. So if you're going to start a new tomato sourcing and list it on Amazon, your chance of being so your chance of getting listed are really, really high because it's no cost to them. They'll, they'll sell as many tomato sauces as you want to offer them because they only you know have to worry about it either making the sale or not. So it's, it, there's no harm in them listing your product. Really easy to do. Really hard to get to people's attention. Go back to the Woolies shelf back in the day and even today. If you can get your product, if you can get Rask tomato sauce on, on the shelf at your local Woolies, um, then you're going to, yes, people still pick up Heinz or they'll pick up Fountain or White Crow or whatever your local tomato sources have been whilst they've been in the category. Um, but when you, when you, you know, when you, if it's on the shelf, someone's going to see it. Someone's going to go, oh, that's new. I'll try that. And so to your point, yes, absolutely. But these days, if you jump onto Amazon and you look for tomato sauce, you might search tomato sauce and maybe you'll get the one that's being promoted or the one that Amazon prefers or one who's paying to get the promotion. But that was always the case with, with catalogs, right? With the, mm. the stuff you get in the mailbox, the junk mail. Anyway, if you're searching tomato sauce, you might just search your tomato sauce and look for the options, but you're probably going to say, I'll search for Heinz tomato sauce or Fountain or White Crow or someone else's tomato sauce. And so to some degree in an online world where we have a much, much, you know, the old paradox of choice, there are just a quantum, you know, many quantums larger range of possible options you can buy in any category you choose to name. The ones that are going to come to the top are the ones that sometimes pay more for search results or sometimes pay Amazon to be featured, but largely the ones that we already know and love or who are creating that knowledge and love. And that does, I think, still bubble to the top as as the best options. I want to say one thing quickly about brands too, mate. It says don't, uh, well, I love them. My One of my biggest investment mistakes, probably my second biggest, third biggest, on a personal level, is I own Coca-Cola Amateur shares. They did really, or not, not terrible, didn't lose a lot of money. They did really badly for me. And what happened was I'd said, Coke, wonderful brand, wonderful business, great distribution network. You can't beat it. All the good stuff that, and those things are absolutely true. What I hadn't allowed for is that Coke is already in every single service station, convenience store, mm. supermarket, corner store in the country. And so what I didn't do, I said, okay, here's all, here's all the defensive characteristics. And by the way, the things that make the business great, give it extra margins. But then I paid a growth, a growth price. And so mm. what I didn't say was, well, hang on, how's Coke going to possibly, even if they took you know Diet Coke out and replaced with Coke Zero, they took out Fanta and put in some energy drink. There's only so many spaces and so many fridges and so many shops and so many towns in Australia, once you've filled them all, that's your growth limit. And so Coke will still be a decent business, but a reminder that brand isn't enough. You still need that growth headroom, unless you're paying a stupidly cheap price. If you're paying for any growth, you've got to make sure that growth is likely um, and you've got to make sure it happens. And that, in my case for Coke, I completely screwed that up. Mm. Well, misery loves company, mate. And um, I was <laughs> all aboard that one too. So don't worry about that. Okay. So let's talk about the, the next step in your journey, which is change the lives of yourself, myself, Mm -hmm. tens of thousands, if not hundreds (laughs) of thousands of people, which is finding the Motley Fool. And in particular, 
becoming part of the team early on here in Australia. How did that come to be? So I've told part of the story, which is that I literally stumbled across the name in a newspaper, um, which is, which is, I, I bet, you know, again, I'll use an outdated uh, movie. Remember the movie Sliding Doors, where mm-hmm. if you go through the door, your life changes. If you don't go through the door, then things go a different way. It was one of those movies that sort of showed what could happen in different paths as, as, uh, as life choices change. So the first thing was, I happened to read the paper on that day. Had I not, I don't know what happens. Mm-hmm. Fast forward, so that was 98. Fast forward to 2010. And I happened to follow The Motley Fool in Australia, America on Facebook. And the CEO, current CEO, still CEO and co-founder Tom Gardner was interviewed by the Washingtonian Business Journal. And I clicked on the link and read it. And he says in one line, I think it was, I've never found the article again, but single line, he basically says, next cab off the rank for the Motley Fool is international expansion. That's it. That's literally all he says. And I'm an introvert by nature, believe it or not, despite my regular appearances everywhere. Um, and and I, I, it's not in, completely out of character. I, I somehow had, had mentally remembered and internalized Tom Gardner's email address which I won't share here for, t- for Tom's benefit, but uh, I just happened to know what, I can't remember why I knew what it was. I just happened to know what it was. Anyway, on spec, just arbitrarily one evening, I'm like, yeah, I got, I'll email him. So I just basically, hi, Tom, I'm Scott. You don't know me. Uh, I don't know if the Motley Fool is ever going to come to Australia. And frankly, I really love my job, which I did. But if you ever come to Australia, if I can be involved in any way to help, because I, you know, I, my life had literally been changed by the Motley Fool in the US. Mm. Um, so I said, look, if I can help at all, I'd love to be involved somehow. Feel free to hit me up. You know, hope it finds you well. Thanks for thanks for reading. You know, that was it. Turns out, three days later, I get a phone call, or an email first, actually, from my now current boss and your old boss, Bruce Jackson, mm-hmm. who actually said, so, turns out, we're planning to open the Motley Fool here in a month or two. Let's chat more. So, again, stupidly lucky in terms of I happen to read the article. I happen to send an email. It happened to be the right time. Uh, and Bruce says, in, and you'll, you'll appreciate this, Owen, um, uh, Bruce said, look, what can you do? I said, well, look, I've done business anal- analysis. I've done a bit of marketing. I've done a bit of uh, trade marketing, a bit of strategy, a little bit of HR, not much. But, you know, these kind of areas, you know, I know you, it's a startup here. If I can be involved in any of those places, you know, I'd, I'd love to be involved. But he wasn't asking for a job as an investor at all. I didn't expect I would be doing that. Um, he said, well, can you write? So I'm like, I don't know. I, 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 I guess. He said, would you want to try? I said, okay, sure. And so it turns out I was the Motley Fool's first freelance uh, writer for, for, mm-hmm. our, for our site, which is still the, the engine room of, of our business. And so um, literally from nothing, he says, well, okay, here's a couple of stories. Wr- write me an article on these three things and send them through and I'll see what I think. Uh, you'll be also unsurprised to know, and for those who are developing their writing, it came back with a whole lot of red pens through it of things you wanted to change, do different things. Like, oh, man, okay. Um, and that's, that's literally how it started. And so from, from someone who was loving their job, uh, I freelanced for the Fool for about 12 months as a writer while I was doing my current job. Uh, and then about a year later, Bruce said, hey, do you want to come and join the team full-time as an investor, a writer and investor? I said, yeah, sure, that'd be great. Um, and that's literally how it happened. So a whole lot of just completely lucky, random conversations and, and, and you know, observations. Uh, I was the second second person in the door at the Fool. Uh, Dean Morell was my predecessor at running Share Advisor, their longest running service, but he left about three or four months, five months after starting Share Advisor. And so Bruce said, so Dean's leaving. Do you want to run Share Advisor? And uh, the rest, as I say, is history, mate. Mm, that's fascinating, mate. I love it because, yeah. yeah that's all luck. All, all, pure, pure luck and circumstance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, I remember when I first started freelancing for the Motley Fool, I think there was probably all up between you, Bruce, Mike, um, yep. Robin, I think, was here at the time in Australia. There you go. Yep. Um, I think... A little bit about uh, it. <laughs> yeah, 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 that was about it. And I sent yeah, you yeah. A, a, an article. It was a doozy. And you came back with red pen. And I, I was I was devastated, Sorry, but I knew man. I had work to do. No, it was, it's it's great because, right, like you've paid it forward, right? So, yeah, um, yeah. So tell us a bit more about Share Advisor. I imagine some of our listeners mm. would be familiar with what the Motley Fool does in Australia at large. But what are you doing inside Share Advisor? Um, and has it changed over the years? Yeah, so um, really good question. Um, how do I answer that? So yes, it has changed over the years. We're almost at our ten year anniversary, mate. In December, it's our tenth hmm. tenth uh, wow. anniversary, which is which is coming up pretty quickly, which is which is exciting. Um, so Share Advisor, look, it's changed because our membership base has changed. We had hundreds of people early on, literally, and so uh, Dean originally, and then when I took over, we were, we were picking some smaller companies because we could, hmm. and then the membership base kind of grew and developed and the, and the service matured to a point where we were simply having too much of an impact on the share price of smaller companies. So we just, we just had to, yeah. And let's look, 
I'm a long-term investor. If we jump dump a set price or by, by 5 or 10%, I'm actually not too worried about it. I know members kind of freak out about it. No one wants to pay more than they have to. But if I'm right about some of these stocks and they double or triple, 10% either way is not a big deal. It's not ideal, mm-hmm. but it's not a big deal. But still, the reality of, of a membership business was members weren't loving it and we didn't like doing it. We had a couple of companies who, NIB famously back in the day was on the was the front page of the, the fin, but it was it was one of the early pages in the fin where the share price jumped eight percent on our recommendation, which I just didn't expect. And um, and so you know the reality was we simply had to change a little bit. So these days we focus kind of on medium and large cap growth companies is probably the best way to describe it. I don't mm. I don't like to be style bound. I don't think it's useful for me at least. Um, so we've recommended turnarounds. We've recommended all sorts of stuff. Um, some of, some of the stodgy old businesses that actually are, have done really really well for us. Some listed investment company style things, but also some really growth businesses that are they're also doing really really well like nanosonics and uh, ordinate those kind of businesses so we kind of do go over the waterfront a little bit but medium to large growth is kind of the the sweetest of sweet spots uh, we do one recommendation a month in the asx we also have a bonus rec from from the us once a month as you know um, and we're just trying to find stocks that we think over time on average will beat the market it's kind of honestly i'm a simple man mate i try and keep it really really simple which is just you know try and get the process right repeat the process over and over again and if you kind of are right on average more often than you're wrong, if the average winner makes more than the average loser loses, then the numbers kind of look after themselves. And I kind of, you know, our industry is is famous for overcomplicating things, telling people how hard it can be, how they couldn't possibly do it themselves, all that mm. stuff. I'm a, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a child of the Motley Fool, quite literally, as I said, as a, a very young person, I discovered the Motley Fool. I learned at the virtual knee of Tom and David Gardner, Bill Mann, Rex Moore, a whole lot of people, Jeff Fisher in the US. Some of those names will be familiar to your listeners, some won't. But um, these are guys who are literally, I learned to invest by reading their stuff. Um, and I'm just trying to keep it simple. And as you said, pay, pay it forward to a group of people. That's, I also said famously, I, I took a 25% pay cut to join The Fool and I don't want congratulations for that. It's more just a, a sign that I wanted to be part of an organization to help people the way I've been helped. And that was kind of my way of doing it. Mm. Mm. I remember receiving, I think it was one of the first share advisor recs. And it was, <laughs> nice. I think, I, for some reason, I had it in like a, a PDF. Because That's I, right. We did yeah, the first, yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah right. On. Whereas now, like you get an email notification and, and you can log in or whatever. Yeah. And I was, I just remember you're, seeing- You're aging me even further on. Stop doing it, mate. <laughs> <laughs> no, I loved, I, I loved it because it was it started from humble beginnings, right? Yeah, and so- yeah. um, one of the questions that I had for you, and this is kind of leading up to where you are today, um, but why do you think, and we can just you can just look at this through the the lens of the Australian business or globally, why do you think the multi fool has been so successful? It's a good question. Um, oh man, so there's so many facets to that. Uh, so there's the there's the business model, and then there's the product, and I think if I separate those two out, each are worth looking at individually. Um, sure. I really think that people know when they're being BSed to and yep. they appreciate some straight shooting, some honest talk and some just just basic reality, right? So when I say this is what I this is who I am, this is what I do, I keep it simple. And that's literally what it is, right? There's no shenanigans, no carry on, no whatever. It's just it's just what we do. And we've never taken ourselves too seriously. We've never tried to talk down to people. We've never tried to make it look difficult or impossible or you need actually couldn't possibly do it yourself. Our job is to, I've always said, we're investors riding for and investing alongside other investors. Literally who I am, 95% of the team are ex-members or readers or freelancers uh, like yourself. And so that was that was the whole idea. The whole idea was simply a case of, hey, you know, we, we, we've learned to do it this way. We think you can too. So that's the on the product side. And we've kept it really simple. One recommendation a month. Here it is. Um, we don't try and be fancy. We don't try anything we're not. We just do it pretty simply. On a business model level, which is probably as maybe even more important, is we disrupted others the way that people have been disrupted in other industries. So scale is its own benefit. We've been able to keep our prices super low um, because we have a very large membership base. And yes, there's a trade-off there, uh, but we can help more people by having prices that are you know less than 100 bucks for a year for some of our entry-level services which you couldn't get back in the day. If you did, you couldn't trust them. So we, we've kind of, you know, we, we lowered the average prescription price for most people by probably two thirds, three quarters um, compared to other services that were out there. And so is it just simply undercutting on price? Yeah, to some degree, but we did it by by doing it with scale. And, and also knowing what we did, Bruce is, again, my boss, super keen on what he calls focus, right? So let's do a few mm. things really, really well. It doesn't be everything to everybody. 
Some brokers cover the entire ASX or most of it, right, with recommendations. And that's cool. And if you want that, go and, go and buy from them. That's, that's awesome. We just simply try and pick the best stocks we can. So we don't cover everything. We don't do, you know, coverage in the way that normal brokers do coverage of updating every company, every recommendation every week and month or year. We don't write daily market reports. Um, we just kind of try and keep it really, really simple, which means we keep our costs down uh, and and scale obviously helps the other side of that. So it's, it's kind of pretty simple. I think that's, I think we're, we're, we're a style that resonates or a business model that works. Um, and we've, again, I say we, I take absolutely no credit for it. I'm not part of the marketing team at all. Um, these guys are just a well-oiled machine who know exactly what they need to do and they do it really, really, really well. Uh, and the results are, are pretty good. We're a private company, so I can't disclose too much financially, but um, the results have been fantastic for us here in, in the US just by kind of sticking in the knitting, doing, doing, a, doing a simple thing really, really well. I think it's probably what's paid off. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, there's so much. Like if you talk about brands, right? I think sometimes... Like if I'm being, I'll just be honest. I, the, yeah, I think course. sometimes some Motley Fool gets a lot of flack because of the marketing, mm-hmm. right? But we do. <laughs> but but um, yeah. But like I've been inside it, and I see how much people care. Um, and when I just talk to people, um, and when I talk to people back in the day, I'd say, you know, this is what we do. And yeah. this would be finance people, and they'd be like, "What do you mean you make money from the members?" <laughs> Like yeah, that's would yeah, be their reaction, right. honestly. Where, it would where, be the how reaction. You got the ticket? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Where's yeah. money so, from companies? So coverage? you take, yeah, so yeah. you take a commission, or <laughs> yeah, yeah, are you right. are you front running these trades? Uh, yeah, 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 what? Yeah. No, yeah. none of that stuff. Yeah. Um, it's yeah, just really exactly. honest, transparent model, yeah. and I think that's one of the things that cut through. So does the name, right? Like I always think the full yeah. name is a brand. It's just a super strong brand nowadays. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and how about then? Because because a lot of people know you. Uh, uh, as an investor, they know about you mm-hmm. from Sunrise, from the tally, see you all over the yep. place. But what, <laughs> people pro- <laughs> but what people probably don't know is that for a while, you managed the Motley Fool Australia as well. And yeah. uh, how did your experience managing like a fast growing, you could call it startup, even though it was really big, how did, yeah. how did that experience change you as a person, as an investor, all of those things? How was that experience oh, that generally was- speaking? I love that question, mate. So yeah, I, I ran the full Australia business for about 11 months. Uh, Bruce went off to, to do a little bit of a start, startup on the side as part of the Motley Fool, stayed with the Fool and, and tried to do something a bit different for, for 11 months um, and then ended up going back and, and running the business. Uh, overall, I stepped back into a, a chief investment officer role. It was, a, um, it was a fascinating time, mate, because I think like everything, you think you know how a business is run. You've had this experience. I probably should be asking you rather than the other way around. But uh, there's one thing to, to be in a role and knowing what's going on in the rest of the business. So the, the, we're always really small. As you said, we started with two people. Um, even now, there's only probably 25 in Australia, I think. Um, so, you know, we're still, we're still a really small team. And and I've always been in those, you know, director of research, advisor, head advisor, whatever it was. So I was really close to the business. and knew exactly what happened, how it worked, what the levers were, what, you know, what, what Bruce would like or not like. It was, you know, so you kind of think you know. And then all of a sudden when you're in the role, the, the sheer size and scope of what's required really expands super fast. So you really get a, a it, in, once it's the same thing, but it's entirely different, right? Not only because you're in charge, I, I didn't find that overly difficult, um, but just because you are aware of and across and dealing with all of the facets all of the time. And it's just a, a very, very different lens. It's almost, you know, to some degree in my previous investing roles, now back in an investing role, you are almost kind of one step removed. You're half a step removed, right? So you're seeing it from the outside. And again, a bit like analyzing a company, you feel like you kind of you know it, but you're not really doing it. When you when you're the general manager for a while, you really do sense exactly what's going on, um, and, and you're involved in all those pieces. Everything from dealing with the US three or four mornings a week, which is just taxing on family time, quite honestly, through to making some of those marketing decisions and trying to work out, you know, where do you draw those lines between payoffs for, as you say, people know our marketing. A lot of people don't love our marketing, and I absolutely get it. But the question really is, you know, the question we're always asking is both for our our shareholders and for our staff and mostly for our members, you know, where does the line start and stop between the ends justifying the means, right? If we don't get those members, and for, look, I hope you don't mind me saying, but Share Advisor is doing a fantastic job of beating the market. I don't do it mm. myself. I do it with a team of people. I always have. Um, if we have fewer members because we don't market as hard, do I, is that a net benefit or a net cost? Now, people who don't like our marketing would say, oh, thank God you stopped marketing to me. Okay, get it. If we had half the number of members, a tenth of the number of members, um, we would be we would be helping fewer people. And so, you know, am I justifying it? Yeah, to some degree I am. And I think reasonably, justifiably, because 
we're, we're, we're doing the right thing. We're on the level. We're, we're legitimate. Um, yes, some people don't like the name. Some people don't like the marketing. I get it. If I had a dollar for every time someone made a fool joke, I'd be a very rich man. I wouldn't be investing anymore, put it that way. I'd live off the proceeds. So it's, it's, you know, it, it is one of those difficult things where you've got to try and work out which levers are the right levers to pull. Um, how do you go about building a brand at the same time as you're running some harder hitting marketing. Um, but again, as you say, you know, we, the vast bulk of our services are beating the market. The vast mm. bulk of our recommendations are beating the market. I'm really, really proud of the investing returns of the business. And you bet I want a whole lot of people to find out, you know, what we can do for them. Again, you know, like I, I own a few shares in the Motley Fool. It's not going to make me rich, it's not going to make me poor. Um, so yeah, I benefit, I guess, if the Fool does well. But literally, as I said, I took a pay cut up front to join the Fool because I wanted to be part of that journey that's why i do the sunrise stuff you know if i stop doing sunrise tomorrow i don't think bruce would care all that much um but i get a chance to say to people hey here is how to think about your financial life whether it's you know budgeting credit cards investing you know borrowing whatever we're talking about you know buy now pay later um i get a chance to hopefully help some people that's literally why i'm doing the job um so you know it's to me yeah the end does justify the means but i do Mm. get that people may have a different view no i so yeah so i just want to reflect on something there because I obviously am the air quotes general manager of Rask, and it's it's bloody difficult, you know. Managing director, mate. Managing, Managing director, director, CEO, founder, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. also probably the janitor and chief electrician, <laughs> chief cook and bottle washer. That's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. But uh, I know what it's like, right? You, you, it's very taxing. And hmm. Bruce's advice to me was very generous. He said the one thing you need is focus. You just need focus yeah. and yeah. whether you're, if you're an investor, be the best investor you can be. If you're yeah. a marketer, be the best marketer you can be. And I think that's so, it's so hard to Great juggle advice. that when you're yeah. in a growth yeah. environment yeah. because yeah. every day there's a priority that comes at you, right? Yeah. And so that, that it makes it so difficult to have that focus when you have so many priorities. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and just on the marketing, mate, like I, 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 I sat back and reflected on, I guess the Motley Fool is an ecosystem a couple of years ago. And Mm. maybe I'm a bit more, I guess I'm, I'm comfortable with it because I run a very similar business, but, um, but I thought about it and I thought, which are the finance organizations in 10 or 20 years that will sit back and say they influenced the most people in the positive, most positive way. And obviously you've got Vanguard, which is just doing it silently in the background, right? It's super cool. Cutting costs inside super. It's, it's going to change the game for so many people around the world. But then yep. from the from an educational content perspective, we've got um, Scott Pape in Australia. Yep. But we've, it's probably fair to say like the Motley Fool globally is a huge driving force to encouraging people to invest, people that mm-hmm. never, ever thought that they could. And I think, you know, David Garner does the snap test where he clicks his fingers and if yeah. it disappeared, would people yeah. notice? Absolutely. If you snapped your fingers and the Fool mm-hmm. disappeared, millions of people around the world would notice. And I think that would be a huge detriment to the industry. Um, one of the things that's very common, and this is me just trying to make a segue between that point and the next one, Scott. Um, <laughs> Go for it. I one love of it. The that's I'll, very, I'll whistle you dance. Yeah, okay. One of the things that's very um, um, obvious when you approach the Motley Fool is um, the writing style. It's very conversational, which is totally different to how – traditional finance rights, you know, they're talking about beaters, using formulas, all this sort of stuff. Exactly. You mentioned before yeah. that you got a lot of red, it may have just been digital red ink on, on your first articles. Yeah. Um, did you have to d- hone that skill over time? And if you did, what did you use to communicate better with members? So, I mean, I've been, I've been very, very lucky um, in a lot of ways. And I mentioned finding the fool in 98 and then joining the Motley Fool in 2011. And there's 13 years of not, I wasn't a member of, I wasn't a paid member the entire time, but I read The Motley Fool the entire time. And I honestly, sometimes you learn by absorbing and watching and sometimes you learn by doing. And I think for me, it was both of those things. I've never done anything formal in terms of writing. Hmm. Um, I, again, I some of these names won't be a whole lot, uh, make a whole lot of sense for a whole lot of people, but people like Bill Mann in the US, you hmm. know, Jeff Fisher, Rex Moore. These people were writing for the fool.com site for years and years and years and years while I was literally cutting my teeth on investing. And honestly, when I started writing, I felt like I had the full voice in my head already. So sometimes you just get lucky, right? There are there are businesses with house styles. We don't have a we don't have a house recommendation on, on anything, mm. but we kind of have a house style, which is exactly as you say, mate, to write. And the other thing, so there's that. 
I'll, I'll call, I'll invoke Warren Buffett again, probably not for the last time in this conversation. Um, he writes in every annual annual letter he writes to his to his shareholders, he writes to share the stuff that he'd want to know if he were in our shoes. In other words, if the roles were reversed, what would he want to know from, from someone writing writing the letter? And if you combine those two thoughts, that's literally how I'm how I'm trying to invest. I'm trying to, uh, to write, sorry, I'm trying to tell a story. I'm trying to make it relatable, understandable. I'm, you have to have an ego to be a stock picker, right? By definition, you have to believe you're, you're better than the market. So none of us escape that. Um, and you do a great job of this, by the way, in terms of your writing as well, mate. But literally the idea of like, I don't, I'm not here to be, I'm not here to be impressive. I'm not here to use big words. I'm not here to convince the readers that I'm a genius. Once you can put that aside, maybe because I'm not a genius, it's easy, right? If you're, if you're a simple man, you've only got so much to work with. Maybe that's my secret. But quite, quite literally, it's like, you know, I, I, I'm, right, I'm writing to tell you a story to try and convince you of a point that I'm trying to make, which I think is in your interest. Hmm. And so if you start with the reader's, because I was a reader for many years, but if you start with the reader's mindset in place, like, okay, what, what, would, what would I want to hear? What would convince me? What would illustrate the point? I try and use some vernacular, some slang. I try and make it relatable. I literally try and make it the conversation. And, you know, generally speaking, I won't say you could read every one of my articles aloud as a, as a speech or as a conversation, but I kind of hope that if you sat next to me and I read that out, you'd be like, you could engage with that in a conversational way. So it's just, it's like, that's all it is. It's just, it's just trying to make, make it accessible, right? Like I don't, ego is so overdone in our, in our industry. You know this, again, mm. you're one of the good guys. I love you being successful, mate, in your business, because the more people who can literally just keep it simple, stop trying to pretend this is overly complex, can't be done, secret squirrel stuff. It's really simple. You just got to make it you know, available to people. And again, because most of my writing, or a lot of my writing, particularly the external stuff I do to non-members is trying to convince people of the value of investing or of a point I'm trying to make, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be persuasive. And so in doing that, I'm not marketing, not trying to make you buy something, just be persuasive about the point I'm trying to make, whether it's the value of superannuation or mm. getting started early. I wrote an article only this week about getting started early and making sure you had money put aside. And, and I'm, all I'm trying to do is think about my, my stepson who's 25 or my sister or my mom or someone else saying, you know, I want to write. So they read that and go, oh, cool, I got it. I should do something about that. And if I, if I can do that for people, that's kind of what, again, that's, that's kind of what I'm here for, right? So if I can do that, that's how I think about my writing. That's the person in my mind's eye as I write those articles. One thing that I, I mentioned in the lead up to this was that, and thank you for the compliments, it's high praise and it's vice versa, of course. Um, so yeah, um, I think you know that. But one of the things that I mentioned in the lead up to this was basically how a lot of really good investors communicate in a way that's personal and even so far as they talk about the personal finance aspect i think here in australia at least amongst the fools that i follow you do a great job of making investing personal and then also talking about how the other things in life superannuation is an example mortgages all those things impact uh, people and i don't think that i don't know i don't know if this is a general point but maybe do you think that that is an effective way to cut through as well it's a good point. Um, yeah, I think it, I think it is. Yeah, I think it is. I think it's everyone has different motivations for wanting to be in the finance industry and different things they want to get out of it. You mentioned Scott Pape before. He is absolutely the the, the poster child for doing this really, really well, right? And it's it's kind of the idea of really. So, so I'm a stock picker for, uh, by trade, right? And, mm. I, and I'm doing a decent job thus far of beating the market, as we should always say, passports no guarantee the legal eagles would like us to say that. So we will. Uh, but it's also true, right? So but but stock picking is kind of part of it. I mean, part of what I was writing earlier this week and and, um, and trying to get across to people was the idea that I can only do so much for you. I can maybe find some market beating stocks that maybe will improve your average returns by a couple of percent a year, which is by the way, compounding a spectacular result. But if you don't save, if you don't invest, if you don't start early enough, it's not so much I can do. If you if you come to me at 64 and say, hey, can you help me beat the market? I'll say, sure, but dude, you're not living much time. There's, there's not much left, right? If I get an 18-year-old and say, you know what? If you if you lose to the market by two percentage points a year, but you invest $1,000 a year for the next 15 years, you will have not a problem. You could, you could lose to the market and still retire stupidly rich. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of... And it does come from, I joke often that if I'd been born in the 18th century, I would have been a stump preacher, right? Because I'm super passionate about helping people improve their financial lives. And yes, I do that through picking market beating stocks, hopefully, and I'm, and I'm trying to do that with other, and with other services as well. But broadly, that's kind of, that's my core role. But the broader role is literally, again, think about people that I, that I know or, or might talk to or just simply imagine might be watching a TV show or listening to this podcast and saying, I want you to be more financially secure. I think you can do that by buying the stocks I recommend. But you know what? Stop paying too much for your mortgage. Go and renegotiate your credit card or frankly, cut it up if you can. 
those things are arguably, you know, they're almost a, they're almost a ticket to the dance, right? You want to invest $1,000 a month or, or $2,000 a quarter or whatever you've got. Great. If you can save it, you can do it. Fantastic. But you're not going to be able to save $1,000 a month with a credit card. You're not going to be able to, you know, put money aside if you're paying too much on your mortgage. And so part of it is just, it's that financial fitness idea of, you know, getting yourself to a point where you can really make that work. Our core customer is 50 plus and is already got a hopefully decent superannuation balance is trying to maximize their retirement. And I love helping those people. I love, oh, can I say even more? Probably can't. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the the 20 year old and the 18 year old and the 25 year old was saying, you know what? I get life sucks. I get you can't afford a house right now. Trust me, let me show you things like the compounding opportunities or the value of saving, you know, 0.4% on your mortgage or something like that. Um, if I can help those people, it genuinely is a bit of a you know, it's a bit, a bit of a quest, a bit of a calling to some degree, I suppose. Um, but I've got the skills. I, I genuinely believe if you have, you know, the old the old biblical line to, to whom much is given, much is expected. It's kind of that. Like, I, you know, I want to have finished my career and think I did everything I could to help as many people as possible achieve financial security, hopefully financial freedom. Um, investing is a really, really important part of that. But I can do more. And I think that's probably why I'm energized and excited about doing some of that other stuff now. Does it help get people get to the multi field, get to investing? Probably, hopefully, yeah. And if that's if that helps, then that's great too. But quite frankly, if they if they join Rask instead of the multi field, I couldn't care less. I mean, I, you know, I do obviously, and you want people to join yours, and hopefully they join both, right? Because we're both doing the right thing. And there are very few good guys in the industry. I count the multi fool and Rask among others. Um, Andrew Page, our mutual friend, who's who's at Strawman, is doing mm-hmm. a great job. I think you know there are. There are few enough good people in the industry that if we can all be a little bit more successful at the expense of some of the bad guys, well, I think we've all done a pretty good job. Mm. Yeah, here, here. Um, I actually had one of the questions that I, I wanted to ask you was, if you go back to say when you were 20, um, mm. if you could give yourself one piece of <laughs> investing advice, um, yeah. maybe if we take away the start early because that would have been the, the yeah. advice, but um, <laughs> what else yeah. would there be, I guess? Um. Really good question, mate. Uh, yeah, starting early, absolutely. Um, I made the joke about Mr. Moyer. He told me when I was 15, I still didn't get around to it till I was 25. But, you know, those 10 years, as Warren Buffett said, the one thing you do is start earlier, right? It's absolutely true. Um, I think I probably would have... So the, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll answer it a different way. The, the lesson I've learned over time is how little actually matters. The old 80-20 rule, right? I was... I mentioned the spreadsheets I was putting... I, w- I was calculating 60 ratios per company per year... <laughs> Um, cause I could do the cash conversion cycle and I could do the, you know, um, gross margin growth and I could do, it was, just, it was, it was a lunacy, right? Absolute quick ratios, current ratios. And, and they're all important, right? In, in, in the sense that, and maybe I wouldn't change it necessarily, but I learned a lot doing it, but I do very, very little of that. I haven't done a DCF in, I want to say five years, just kind of cash flow. Um, some people swear by them and will, will hate me for saying that. That's cool. Um, Sometimes it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's, if you get the big things roughly right, rather than trying to get the little things really, really right and kind of missing the big picture, that's probably the lesson. I, I, I probably missed a lot of opportunities. I made a lot of mistakes trying to be too specific or too cute or too clever or too detailed. I probably got lost in the analysis, the old paralysis analysis thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think I probably would have, I probably would have told myself, look, think about the things, go back to our brand conversation, think about the things that matter most, focus on those. If you get those right more often than not, You'll win more often than not, and again, it, it, investing is a game of probabilities, right? You, you got to roll, you got to keep rolling those dice over and over and over and over again because the averages play out. The more rolls you take, maybe the gambling analogy is not a great one, but you get the idea. Um, the more times you do it, if you if your process is right, the more likely you are to be right. More often you'll be right. Um, so maybe it was that just just not getting lost in the weeds of trying to calculate everything about everything and focus on actually what does matter about. Let's pick Woolworths, right? What's going to matter most? Does it matter that the day's day's inventory outstanding has gone from 13 to 14 and a half? Probably not. Now, if it's a long-term trend, it's getting a lot worse and margins are going down, then yeah, it does matter. But broadly, are they going to keep growing? Is there opportunity for, for margin improvement? Those are bigger questions that if I'd focused on more, I probably would have got more right more often, I think, early on. And it probably would have made a meaningful difference to the compound value of what I have today. Mm. I think you make a really good point there about, I, I find now I, ha- having, I guess, some experience in it is that, the investors who can see the whole, the, the, the big picture are often far more successful. And I think that's something when I was indoctrinated into the kind of full ethos was that um, the the recommendation that came out kind of focused on the, the essence of a business really well. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of investors, particularly those that are coming to investing for the first time or just even, you know, less than five years experience, they might be thinking, well, how, 
you know, how much science can I put in this and what, mm-hmm. you know, little cog in this giant wheel do I need to get right yeah, in order yeah, to, right. to see everything? And I think just zooming out is actually probably the mm-hmm. best advice at all. Um, I've got a kind of more pointed question, which is around, has there like been any company or investment that you've made either yourself to someone else for members mm-hmm. that have, that have you, that you, that stands out as something as a company, an example that you've learned a lot from. So any lessons learned from a particular company or strategy or, or, or what mm-hmm. have you? Can I give you two? Yeah, you can give us me as many as you All want. Right. So let, let's there's two, two for opposite reasons. So mm-hmm. um, the first one I, I regularly rub my nose in is Domino's pizza. Mm-hmm. And this is one of those, talk about big picture stories. This is one of those situations where I recommended it, Eight bucks ish, I think, and it got to about thirteen. So I was up at sixty percent. Those numbers were exactly right, but kind of that sort of number. And so we done pretty well. It was in about eight months, ten months. I thought I thought it felt like a genius. This is very early, maybe two thousand thirteen, something like that. Hmm. And same store sales started to slow. And so I looked at that and went, well, okay, sales got shares got from eight to thirteen. Same store sales are slowing. How much bigger can this business really be? How many pizzas can we really possibly eat? I'll take my money off the table and sell it. Now, if you followed the, the domino story, the shares subsequently went to 70, back to 40. Now they're over $100 a share. Uh, the, the compound value of what I lost would have made, I could, I could have had five, six, seven other companies go to exactly zero, and I still would have made money for our members if I recommended and kept that recommendation of dominoes as a buy right through that period of time. And so sometimes we focus on the, the losers. We say, well, this, went, this stock fell 40%. That was a terrible idea. Or this one went down, one of my stocks, I sent you, is down 96%. You bet that hurts. <laughs> But that's 96%. Mm-hmm. It lost almost all of it. But the dominoes lost from 13 to 100. Man, I, I could have another six licentures and still have made money. And so that's kind of, for me, the lesson of letting a good business run. And to your point about the big picture stuff, if I just said, you know what? Don May's a good CEO. The business is still growing. Yeah, things will be fluctuate a little bit. But man, if I've done all this work to find a great business, I say regularly, I try to be slow to buy and even slower to sell. If it earned a position in my portfolio because it was great, you want to be dead sure that you're, you've absolutely you know, shown that it can't be great anymore before you part company. So that's that's one I've learned a heap from. I sell much, much more slowly. I give management teams much more rope. By the way, that means I have more losers these days. Mm-hmm. And that would seem, some people listening are going to say, well, that's terrible. What a stupid idea. Yep. But the winners I have because I let businesses run still well and truly overwhelm those losers. And so, again, thinking as a portfolio rather than individual companies, Big, huge lesson there, mate. Some, so many people are trying not to get any investments wrong. That's completely the wrong lens. You are mm. absolutely using it's, it's the forest and the trees thing you mentioned before. If I'm trying to make sure there's one tree in front of me doesn't die, but in the meantime, I miss the fact that there's 50 out around it that are growing like gangbusters, I'm completely missing the point. So that's that's the first. Second, I'll go back to is corporate travel management. It's a business I own personally still. I did own Domino's, by the way, and sold it, but no disclosure required. Um, mm-hmm. Corporate travel I still own. I have for, for years. Um, thankfully, our members got a better price than I did, so I feel really good about that. Um, this was one that was very much a Peter Lynch kind of story, a scuttlebutt story. I'd used corporate travel management when I worked at Blackmore's and I knew the business, I knew it was good, I knew we liked it, I knew what its features and benefits were. When I joined The Motley Fool, I realized it was a listed company and I did more work on it. And corporate travel kind of encapsulates really nicely a lot of the lessons of, of my investing career, right? Buy something you know, not just because you know it, by the way, but start with something you know because it gives you a, a good insight. Customer loyalty was huge. Their, their um, recurring revenue was huge. They win awards all over the joint. People don't leave them as customers. They're selling up more and more customers. They're doing something right. And another one of my favorite lines is, if you can be more relevant to more people more often, you've probably got a good business. And mm-hmm. it's the reversal we talked about, you know, losing customers. Um, corporate travel get customers. They keep customers. They sign up more customers. They stay with them for ages. Really good corporate culture. People love working there. Their customers love working with them. That's a really, really good start. Then if you look at the economics of growth, they made some at the time reasonably small bets in international expansion and have done a really, really good job and continue to do a really good job right through the period of acquiring when there was value, uh, growing the business organically as well. Organic growth has always been roughly half total growth. So yeah, they're acquiring at at speed, but they're also growing organically at speed. And that's a really good combination. And the last one, again, that slow to sell thing, there's been a couple of big short theses about corporate travel over my time as a shareholder. And again, they've mostly washed out. They've been a really, really good reminder not to get freaked out by short-term fears, even when they are glossy short-selling reports with emotive language and photos. Just remember that, you know what? Sometimes shorts are right, by the way. And again, this is a probabilities game. But finding a good business with management we knew and trusted, 
with a business model that we liked, that the customers loved. It's one of those businesses that kind of ticked, to, to use the old expression, all those boxes. And it just felt like a really good business to own. If I could find another dozen of those, you know, one or two of them might actually go really badly for reasons I can't foresee. But overall, it's a really good reminder of the sorts of things I'm looking for when it comes to those mid-large cap growth businesses um, that I think have an outsized chance of being really, really good. Mm. Oh, I love those examples. Um, and having seen you recommend them um, and and stay with many of the businesses. I know Domino's uh, might be a regret for you, but there's many instances. <laughs> like I think I, I, I went back um, and I wrote an article and I think it was 2014, 2015 about the, f- the things that I'd learned from the individual people at The Motley Fool in my time there. And the mm. thing that I... Th- the thing that I learned from you is that one of the things, one of the many things was it's okay to let your winners run. And I don't just mean that in a general, like a very kind of shallow, um, banal use of the word. I mean, in terms of, you know, there's some, there's a deeper meaning to that. And that is, you've got to let successful things be successful. And, you know, if you go right back to the beginning, um, the first year, say of the share advisor scorecard, there's still brilliant companies in there, right? From you saying nearly 10 years ago, they're still in there. Uh, and that's yeah. that's unreal. And you, the only way you can do that is if you have that kind of uh, mantra and that philosophy around investing. Um, I will, I just, there's just a couple more questions here. And I, people have obviously getting the impression if they haven't read your work or seen you somewhere before that you're an educator, right? Like you are an investor, but you educate, which is, which is fantastic. And um I think you would have given this question a lot of thought long before I asked you it, but um, where do self-directed investors, because I'm talking about self-directed investors because they're primarily yep. the people that join the Motley Fool to get some direction, is yep. where do they go wrong? And maybe there's kind of two two ways to tackle this. One is from like a beginner mm-hmm. perspective, like where do, they, where do you mm-hmm. see beginners often going wrong? And then, yep. you know, investors, even investors that have been in the game 10, 20, 30 years, where are they typically going wrong? You know, I've never actually thought a lot about the last question, so I'm, I'm looking forward to getting that one, uh, tackling that one. The first one, in terms of beginner investors, I think is misunderstanding the game. And I don't mean game in a superficial sense or in a in a kind of it doesn't matter sense, hmm. but the the fundamentals of good investing are just so incredibly poorly misunderstood. And there's probably a book at some point somewhere in this. Um, but if you think about, you know, what do most people try and do? Well, firstly, they try and get the hot winner from somebody. And then if one of them goes wrong, we have, we have members regularly, and I don't take any pleasure in this, but members regularly who buy one of our stocks, it goes badly and they give up or call us names and then tell their friends how terrible we are, how we lost the money on this one stock. And it's, it stems from a fundamental misunderstanding of what investing is actually about. I don't know if you know this, mate. We had a, many years ago, a, a professional punter, a horse, horse race punter, literally, came and spoke to us when I was working at a company, a Melbourne Cup day. It was one of those things that was organized by the business. And his approach, and apparently the approach of most professional punters, is he bets on almost every horse in the race. Hmm. And it's a really good reminder, right? Because they're not trying to say, well, this horse will win, you know, Rask Rocket will win will win the first at Mooney Valley. What they're saying is, well, okay, there's a whole lot of horses, 10 horses in the race. And Rask might be a, a you know, three to one on favorite. And so you want to be on that horse because it might win. But the second and third and fourth favorites also run a chance of winning, and there are different odds. And so they size their bets accordingly, and they try and make 10 to 15% per race. So if you think about, you know, as mug punters, what do we do? We go and try and bet back the, you know, 10 to 1 favourite, make 10 times our money and go and splash it on beer and, and food after the race. The, the professional punters are realising they need to spread their bets, be diversified, bet on almost everything, try and get a reasonable return per race, not a spectacular return, a reasonable return per race. It's a very, very different way than what the average mug punter thinks about the idea of racing. Now, if I take that back to investing, you know, most people don't start by saying, I'm going to add regularly every month to a new company. I'm going to get to 10 or 15, 20 companies as much as possible. I'm going to make sure I'm diversified. I'm going to expect that three, four, five, or six of those are going to lose money, literally lose money. A couple will probably match the market. A couple might outperform. Um, when I've made the old one of my, you know, I'm sure yours as well, least favorite, you can't go broke taking a profit idea that, again, we've talked about corporate travel. If I'd, I recommend corporate travel at a cost base, just a cost of about $2.50. It's now 21 bucks. If we'd taken our profits at three or four or five or seven or 10 or 12, the, the, the money left on the table would have been astronomical. So, you know, understanding the rules of what makes for successful investing 
and a successful investor, and what's a what makes for a great portfolio res, result or report. That that to me is probably the thing that I wish I could instill in more beginning investors. Is here's how the game is played well. Here's how you should play it. Here are some of the mistakes to avoid. That's probably the the biggest picture is not getting your head right. Mm. I think for experienced investors, it's a whole different kettle of fish. Um, some and the, so I don't have a single answer. Some have been successful. So the banks are a great example, right? Banks were wonderful for 35 years. If you'd have bought banks and reinvested the dividends from 1980 to about 2015, you're, you're not working anymore, right? You're on holidays somewhere, you're driving your expensive Mercedes and doing all sorts of good stuff. The, the idea that that's because it was great for a while, so therefore it'll always be great. Banks over the last five years have been terrible investments. Mm. And the, the change was, the circumstances changed, the prices changed, the growth potential changed, which was about Coca-Cola. The growth of the banks went away because they, they absorbed the market, they became the market. So there's much less growth left. Now that's that's fine, but you know the, the the hubris or extrapolation or call it what you want of being successful and getting to a point of then screwing it up effectively by assuming that the past must be the future. And I don't blame him. You get lulled into a false insecurity. Who wants to miss out the next 35 years of great returns, right? I mean, banks have been so good. How could they possibly go badly? And by the way, I've got to pay tax. That's a terrible idea. We know that in the fullness of time, had you paid your full capital gains tax five or six years ago and invested in anything else or just the market, you would have done much better than owning the bank. So that's probably one. I, I think people can also maybe buy their own hype a little bit too much. And I'm always trying to make sure I'm guarded by the same things, which is if you are successful, um, particularly in a particular area, if you were a great investor in Kodak <laughs> up to 1980 something, um, you know, were you lucky or were you great? Um, CEO is the same. If you look, there's a bit of a tangent, but you look at some CEOs who've been successful in one business, mm. often you go to ask, and I won't name names because I don't want to slander anybody, but there are some CEOs out there who are absolutely lionized for being geniuses. And I look at that and kind of go, you know what? That's probably more just right place, right time, got lucky. Unless you can do it a second or third time in different industries, there's a very good chance you owe much of your success to luck. And as investors, we've got to be careful that we don't do the same thing, fall into the same sorts of traps. So I think that that's probably really important. Um, the last one is probably the longer you've been investing, and probably it comes with age, really frankly, without insulting anybody, is just remembering that disruption and innovation continue to happen. Mm. And so just remembering to look forward, not backwards. It's kind of a bit of the extrapolation thing I talked about, but in a different way here, where you're looking forward and saying, okay, the businesses that were successful over the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, noughties, they're not going to necessarily, some will, they're not necessarily going to be the ones that are successful in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And I'm not saying sell everything and buy just the new cool stuff. I'm not saying, you know, go and chase the hot stocks. All I'm saying is think about the trends that are changing business right now. Think about where the returns are likely to come. I'm, I'm a massive fan of e-commerce. I own probably three or four, five e-commerce companies um, globally and here in Australia. And that's largely because if you think about the growth rates, Woolies is a great business. I love it to death. They've got a wonderful culture. They're doing a really, really good job. They, they will be, they'll be completely fine. But really hard for them to grow at any meaningful rate. And if you're paying 25, 30 times earnings for a business not growing, you're really going to struggle. Look at some of the smaller e-commerce players here and overseas that are getting up to scale and, and proving themselves out, taking some market share. Those are probably going to be the winners of the future, right? Now, they may not. Maybe Woolies does street the field. But looking forward, not just backwards, I think is something that investors need to always remember to do. Don't get too calcified. Don't get too stuck in your ways. Mm. Super easy to do. Um, I, I struggle with it myself, quite honestly. You talk about some of the branded businesses. I have a penchant for the older stuff that I know well. I've got to keep reminding myself that, yeah, look, I love JB Hi-Fi. I love Woolies. I think Kogan's got no own Kogan shares. I think Kogan's got more chance. I've got to get myself out of the you know, work for Woolies. I love it as a shopper, um, but it doesn't make it a great investment. You've got to keep looking forward. I, I really, what really gives me the gripes is um, when you see like the rich lists and they say yeah. 20 most successful people or whatever in Australia. And you're like, yeah, yeah just yeah. because they started one thing doesn't <laughs> make right, them successful exactly. people. They might be yeah. wealthy, but they're not necessarily yeah. successful. <laughs> that's a, that's a great point. And, too. That, and that's to your point. I see that too in investing, yeah. right? And we see yeah. a lot of, we've got the disclaimer front and center past performance, mm -hmm. you know, it's yeah. not indicative or not necessarily indicative of future performance. And yep. we see that in funds management where some fund managers are really good for a given <laughs> exactly. length of time and they're, you know, they're successful. They've got gold stars next to their fund, but then the next yep. year they're terrible. Um, and I think one of the big reasons is that people, um, and this is not just, you know, old, young, male, female, whatever, mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. fail to adapt. Um, yep. And in particularly in investing, we failed to adapt to trends. So, you know, two years ago, it might've been high rates of recurring revenue, SaaS companies, the year before that, it might have been marijuana companies. Next year, who knows what it's going to be. But <laughs> yeah, exactly, you, can, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you need a philosophy that kind of brings all of these things together and allows you to change. Yeah. How do yeah. you 
how do you um, think about ensuring that you as an investor are across mm-hmm. these things? And is there any kind of like, do you spend an hour a day reading? Do you meditate? Mm-hmm. Do you follow certain people? Is there anything that you do that other people can learn from to try and maintain that flexible mind? So I'll start by saying that I wouldn't be egotistical enough to believe that I have all the answers of this thing, any, any of these questions. So, you know, again, trying to keep your ego in check is, is super important. <laughs> um, I try and read really widely, yeah. Um, I I like, it helps to like innovation and disruption and, and like change, like business, kind of the, 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 the game of business. And again, if you, not not again, not to make it superficial, but the idea of the things that are changing and moving around that are, that are making a difference, I think really matters. So being kind of flexibly minded and just, wanting to look forward like wanting to find the next not next big thing not in the hot stock sense i mean i know that we all want to find the next hot stock but the idea of just you know kind of what's emerging what's doing well what's succeeding uh, that i think to me that's really important if you can love business then you kind of in, are drawn to those success stories i think that's really important by the way you mentioned the the, the between most successful people i also tend to call if you excuse the phrase uh, a lot of business books i call it success porn <laughs> and it's just that idea of like you know hey i can be real like richard branson if i read his book it's like, you know what? You really, really, really can't. And I don't blame Brands for writing the book and he's great. And we're all inspired by it. But just remember, you you can't take any of those those recipes for people who are in the right place. I mean, Branson, you know, if you want to try and start Virgin Records today selling, selling you know, LPs, good luck to you. Um, but, you know, you can't be Branson. You can't be any of these people. And so that's, that's really important. Back to your question. Um, look, I think uh, I'm a big fan of, you mentioned letting winners run. Businesses will tell you uh, by their results, how their customers are um, interacting with, enjoying, uh, valuing the services that they offer. And so quite honestly, again, keeping it simple, right? You don't have to be, a, I'm not saying buy everything that's growing because you get some that are going to be complete fads and, and fall over. But if you look at some of those businesses and say, hang on, well, people are spending more money with this or they're signing up more customers over here with that or this thing is changing. And one of the things about being a relatively simple bloke is it literally is sometimes you're just looking around, like literally being aware of what's actually going on around you. Um, an investment we made for on behalf of our members, or at least recommended, was ARB, the the, mm. the car company. Now I happen to own a four wheel drive and, and took it on holidays recently. So I was familiar with the product and the category, right? And then if you start to think about, okay, I'm familiar with it, I'm interested in it. And then it turned out that well, actually four of the top five, I think eight of the top selling new cars were four wheel drives, either Utes or wagons. So you start to think, think, hang on, if that's the case, if, if that's the trend and it's increasing that way, and again, just, just be interested, be interested, quite literally being interested. So, well, hang on, isn't that, isn't that likely to end up with more aftermarket parts and accessories? Well, yeah, probably. And honestly, the ARB thesis is not super complicated, much more than that of if the business is growing and keeps growing, it's not, it's not priced for that. There's an opportunity here to make some money. And, and again, you mentioned our recommendations. We've had members who've cancelled because we didn't provide them with, you know, PL line by line for the next five years, you know, year by year. You know, what, what, where's the EBIT margin for fiscal year 2024? I have no idea and I'm not going to try and guess because I'm going to get it wrong. You can't possibly know these things out this far anyway. So it's all false comfort. If I get the broad business idea right, which is great brand, well-run business, family owned and involved, uh, a company I own shares now, I should say, by the way, again, bought at higher price than our members. Um, you know, in a category that's growing, in, in a market that's growing, it just seems likely that they'll sell more more parts in a couple of years on they are today. Like it's, again, it, you know, I, it, it almost feels neglectful or negligent to, to say that's all there is to it. People say, oh, surely it must be more complex than that. You know what? It's often just not. And that's that needs to be okay. Um, and if you can kind of get keep that in mind and just stay interested, look around and see what's happening, literally in your life, in the papers, um, I don't read a whole lot of trade journals ever, mate, because it's just, you know, it's not that complex. If you see a growing business, that's the first point. If you understand why it's growing, you're in a pretty good place. If you understand why you think it might keep growing, that's pretty good. Now, the price matters. It always matters. So I don't want to say by anything that's growing, that'd be crazy. But if you can start to understand the business pretty well and get that under your belt, the rest kind of looks after itself. Mm. Yeah. Ditto. Um, okay. We've, um, we've spoken for quite a while already, but um, I've, Sorry, got, <laughs> I've got, um, maybe actually I'll, I'll spin these around. So just All for right. um, for listeners' sake that haven't joined Share Advisor but want to get more of your <laughs> your your recommendations, more of your work, um, just read yeah. up, go back to the beginning and look at the first year's recommendations, the very first recommendation you made perhaps and, and see how things have changed. How can they find Share Advisor? Where would they go hey. and all those things? <laughs> 
You're, you're, you're a kind man. All right, so um, I, I don't want to do too much promotion, but uh, so fool.com.au is our website. You can jump on there. We, we publish a whole lot of uh, free articles by some of our, our staff writers and freelance writers, uh, but you can actually sign up to our email newsletter called Take Stock there. Um, I write for that two or three times a week, and we send you a whole lot of marketing. So full disclosure, I'm not going to pretend you will get some marketing from us, but Sure. You ask the question. The best way to do it is actually there because you get you're getting the best prices that we have to offer. So you can you can join Share Advisor just going through the links on the homepage at fool.com.au. You'll pay retail price and if you want to. I'm sure the boss will be very happy to take retail price, uh, but please don't. <laughs> uh, please get the best price you can. So best, yeah. There will be some marketing. There's some emails from me. Um, so full full disclosure and full warning. But you'll get a you'll get a pretty good deal on some of our services. So go to fool.com.au. Um, there's a take stock little box. I think it's on the right hand side of the homepage. Uh, drop your email address there, and we'll uh, we'll send you some marketing and, and some good prices on some of our products, including Share Advisor. Yeah, yeah. There's always a discount on offer. So if you if you're paying attention, so um, I'll provide links in the show notes too to join Take Stock and, and oh, to learn more about Thanks, the full mate. services. Um, mate, you've like from a distance, I've watched you. Over the last ten years, watched you go from the first freelancer to you know, investment advisor um, to chief investment officer, general manager. Now you're regular. You're a regular on Sunrise. You're on the radio. You've got one of the top ranked podcasts. Um, when you look back over mm-hmm. your career. Um, Feels like what? this is your life, mate. You're not gonna do this is yeah, your life yeah. on me, are you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not done yet. Not done yet. And then we got the B roll. Uh, so, um, <laughs> exactly. so, um, what, what, what do you think? Like, because you're still in it, right? Yeah. What do you think you'll be most proud of? Oh, uh, that is, this, this is your life. Um, <laughs> I would like to think that I've played a part in unlocking some keys to financial freedom and security for some people. And as I said before, everything from saving a few bucks by budgeting better right through to picking the winning stocks that are going to beat the market and help those savings do even more. Um, I have no, I, I literally, well, we've all, we all got ego, right? I don't have any designs to be the world's greatest stock picker or to pretend to be the world's greatest stock picker. There are people who will be as good and better than me there must be by definition only one best person. And so we're all striving to be really good and be the best if we could. It'd be silly of me to say, I, I want to be mediocre because I don't. I want to always find the best stocks and, and deliver the best you know investment returns for people. But I, I kind of not driven by that specifically. It's not, not I, I don't need the gold star. I don't need the number one next to my name. I don't need any of that stuff. And I honestly think we haven't touched as much on it um, as frankly most of my rantings are. So it's probably a good conversation. Thank you. Uh, investor psychology is so dramatically important. So if I could... If I could do one thing, it would be to help people think better about their finances writ large, everything, as I said, from saving through to investing better. Because um, I'm, I'm reasonably convinced, you know, you know the stat that the average managed fund loses to the index, mm. but the average managed fund investor loses to the average managed fund. And that, that's because they're, they're chasing last year's winner or they're trying to pick winners. They're pulling money out, putting money in, trying to time the market. The... the the, the mistakes we make, the you know, we are our own worst enemy in so many areas, including in finance. So for me, if I could help people think better and achieve more with their finances writ large and, and shares in particular, um, if I can have that on my epitaph, mate, I'd be, I'd be pretty stoked. Yeah, well, I think you're doing that, mate. And I think, um, you know, over the years, you've, well, you've definitely touched millions upon millions of people with lots of common sense advice, lots of good advice. Um no, and so I think, probably not millions. Maybe we'll go, we'll go with thousands and see. No, if no, no. Well, that. I don't know how many people watch <laughs> Sunrise these days, but um, but you got to, There's also the second order, right? In terms of you educate the person who then educates um, their children, their friends, their family members, their football club, their netball club, mm-hmm. whatever. And yeah, I think yeah. as investors and people that have the privilege of doing stuff like we're doing right now. We, it's often not visceral because we're we're behind a keyboard or behind a computer yeah. screen in this instance. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like on behalf of everyone, thanks for doing that, Scott. And thanks for everything that you've done for my development too. And um, finally, thanks for coming on the show. It's been a long time coming and I'm just really appreciative of your time. 
So thanks for joining me. Mate, I really appreciate the invitation. Thank you very much. Congratulations on all your success, mate. This podcast, your business. As I said, there are there are many, or if, there are very few really good guys in the industry. You're, you're definitely one of them, mate. So I've, I very much appreciate the invitation. I've enjoyed chatting with you. We don't do it anywhere near enough. Mm. So maybe we should we should do it more. But uh, mate, thank you for everything you're doing as well to, to, to fly the same flag. We're, we're doing our best to to help people. And I think if we can both be successful as businesses, then uh, we'll, be, we'll be adding some real value to, to Australia and, and hopefully outside the borders as well as to... Uh, improving people's financial future. So mate, th- thanks again for having me. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Australian Investors Podcast, which is proudly supported by JP Morgan Asset Management. JP Morgan Asset Management provides opportunities to strengthen and diversify investment portfolios through alternative income strategies with the JP Morgan Equity Premium Income ETF or ASX JEPI, J-E-P-I, currently the world's largest active ETF with assets under management of US $25.49 billion as at the 16th of May, 2023. For more information, you can visit the JP Morgan Asset Management website by visiting am.jpmorgan.com slash au. That's am.jpmorgan.com slash au.